Um, when I was, you know, three, my mom taught me the alphabet and uh, the, how to count. And then she was looking for something else to make me memorize. So she had me learn the planets in order from the sun. So it was really low level brainwashing. Nice, nice. So let's, I don't want to keep people in suspense. What is Mission Dragonfly? Just describe the project. Well, um, it's a nuclear interplanetary quadcopter, which sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> okay. Um, and Translate, please. <laughs> and and uh, many of the people I talk to think it's, you know, even us professionals think it's crazy. But um, we were thinking of how to explore a moon of Saturn called Titan. Uh, and Titan uh, is unusual. It's the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. So we were considering how to explore it after um, the Cassini mission that had uh, just ended uh, in 2017. Uh, we were actually thinking about this before Cassini ended, of course, but how to, what the next step would be there. And we wanted to, to try to achieve on Titan what we've done on Mars with rovers. Okay. But on Titan, uh, there are some advantages uh, and some reasons that you might not want to send a rover. For, so for instance, the air on Titan is four times thicker than the air on Earth, and the gravity is seven times lower. This is the easiest place to fly in the solar system. Uh, nice. Plus, there's a lot of sand dunes around. You don't really want to be sending a rover into sand dunes. The Mars rover has not done well in the dunes. So we hit upon this idea of, instead of sending a rover, sending a, 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 a quadcopter. So Dragonfly is um, a giant half-ton lander but it gets around on the surface of Titan without using wheels. Instead, it just uses um, its rotors to be able to lift up uh, and fly off to its next destination. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with the project? Well, um, I'd been thinking many, for many years about how to achieve this kind of mobility. Um, and I actually came up with this idea um, uh, based on ideas. I mean, no one works in a vacuum, right? So I came up with this idea of uh, sending a, a giant quadcopter to be able to sample Titan's dunes. Um, and I brought it to my uh, colleague at the J Applied Physics Laboratory uh, of the Johns Hopkins University. Um, and he managed to put it through the bureaucracy there um, in order to get it funded to a level that we could uh, put in a proposal. Uh, and that proposal went into NASA and there were 12 total proposals. Um, and as you can imagine, these are very highly contested. Yes. Everyone in my field wants this. And it is the single largest scientific competed grant opportunity offered by the US government. Wow. Um, it is a big, big deal. And we were the one that of that 12 uh, that was selected after, a, as you can imagine, NASA wants to be very careful with who they, whom they select. Um, and so they uh, have a very rigorous review panel. And we were the one that came out of that process. Wow. How long were the, was it in review? I know it must have taken years. It was, yeah, three and a half years. Um, um, there were two rounds of review. We had, we submitted our proposals or we, we were notified that there was an announcement for opportunity. We spent a year to put together our proposal. Uh, and then uh, it was evaluated for uh, six or eight months. And then we were given uh, another year of, of funding to be able to refine the proposal. We made it to step two, the round two there. And then there was another round of review. Um, and I've done some of these reviews for NASA before, and they are really, I think they're, I was impressed by the job we did. Maybe that's easy to do, <laughs> but we really gave a lot of free, um, and we really re read all the, uh, you know, gave everyone the full opportunity, and they were very critical, um, very critical reviews. Yeah, I bet, I bet. So, um, but three years is nothing compared to when this project will actually launch, when the, uh, Copter will get there. Talk a little bit about, about time frame. I mean, this is a talk about uh, an exercise in patience and diligence. <laughs> yeah, when you're exploring the outer solar system, you kind of you kind of have to have to be ready to to to, to wait for a while. So we will. Uh, we were selected uh, last June, uh, June of 2019, uh, and then we uh, will uh, launch in April of 2026. We have that time to refine refine the idea down. Um, the more time you have to think about it before you actually get down to cut metal to build it, it turns out the better off you are, the cheaper right. it ends up being, because you can make your mistakes on paper instead of uh, in, in uh, meat space. Sure. Uh, and after we launch, we have a nine, an eight and a half year cruise through the inner solar system getting gravity assists to get ourselves out to Titan. And we arrive in December of 2034. 
And is that when you'll start getting pictures? Yeah, so we will uh, enter the atmosphere and uh, it'll take us about two hours to get down to the surface. And we'll immediately start um, acquiring images and beaming them home. Um, you know, it's gonna take a couple days before we get full resolution uh, detail of our, our, our entire surroundings, but we will start getting um, scientific return immediately. Wow, wow. Any speculation or ideas about what will be the first thing you'll see and what you're hoping those uh, images will show? Well, we're landing, we're landing in Titan's sand dunes. It turns out Titan has more, um, a greater fraction of surface covered in sand dunes uh, than any other world uh, in the solar system. Okay. Uh, about 20% of its entire surface and maybe half of its equatorial tropics are covered in sand. Um, sand maybe isn't so interesting here, but the sand on Titan is made of organic material. So think of giant mountains of coffee grounds maybe. Um, and we really want to, to be able to sample those organic materials and see what's happened there. There's more complexity of organic carbon molecules at Titan than anywhere else that we know of in the universe other than Earth. And what we really want to find out is how far have those organic molecules gotten? How complex have they gotten? How come far have they come along toward the path toward life? Or have they indeed made the transition to become self-replicating um, and form a, a, a kind of life that would be very different than what we know of? Um, and that's what we're very interested to find out. Okay, great. Um, so all along this time period, do University of Idaho students get to work on this with you? Um, so when we originally put together the proposal, I avoided having students on it. And the reason is, I thought we had no chance. This was such an aggressive idea, okay? Mm -hmm. The reputation around NASA is that they always pick the safe mission, the mission that's least likely to embarrass a politician 10 years in the future when, when something goes wrong. Yes, yes. Um, uh, and many of my colleagues proposed very safe missions and there's just no way to like spin what we were doing as the safest option. I think it's not, as, it's not nearly as, as um, crazy as it sounds. Um, but we pitched it as, uh, you know, the, the, the really exciting science return and that it's actually quite reasonable. There are risks, um, but they're not as bad as you might think. Um, and so we were able to, to convince the panel that we had the very best science and a manageable risk posture. Uh, and that's what uh, allowed us to move forward. Right, but students will, will not be a part of that? Right. Thank okay. you. Um, so uh, I I'd lost track. Um, I didn't put students on there because I thought we had a one in 12 chance if it were random and I thought we didn't even have that. I thought our best chance was to get a good review and then use that to write better proposals. So I had one student who I put on there, my graduate student, Shannon McKenzie, because she, she was basically ready to graduate. She was waiting for her husband to, to graduate from biology. So sure. I thought it'd be, a good, it'd be a good exercise for her to learn how painful this process was. <laughs> we didn't get it. So she's now a full co-investigator um, on the mission. She's one of only 35 people in the world that's a full funded co-investigator on the mission. Um, and she's got a job now, a fully funded job there at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. She's a real rising star because of this extreme long shot that she took that came through. Sure. However, now that we are funded, um, I'm bringing new students in, um, uh, mostly not undergraduates, mostly graduate students, um, although I do have undergraduates involved in other aspects of research. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just starting to involve more graduate students and bring them into the process to be able to uh, uh, really freshen and keep a, a fresh pipeline of, of new uh, excited people so that we're not all gray and wrinkly by 2034, there'll at least be some of us that are, you know, still young and vigorous. Wow, what an amazing opportunity for those students. So it sounds like if, if you work on a project like this, you should be able to write your own ticket by the time it's done, yes? Uh, that's what happened to Shannon. Um, I mean, if we'd not gone selected, it would have been worth nothing. Yes. Um, but the fact that it hit, she shot the moon essentially. Um, and uh, she's, she's got a career. Um, she's funded, to, she's funded till 2038 at least until the end of our prime mission. So that's pretty good. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. What will your work entail, um, Jason? Is it the design of the copter? Is it the work of what it will do? What's your role in this great big undertaking? So I'm the deputy principal investigator. So I'm like the vice president. So, you know, I'm involved in everything, but I'm not at the top. I don't, I'm not pulling all the strings. Um, uh, so I'm uh, working with the data, um, working with the science team. 
uh, working, uh, I'm not directly, con don't directly control the budget or anything, but I'm gonna be right there uh, deciding where we go and where we fly next and what we sample and what we do when we get there. Um, so uh, there, until then, there's, uh, right now we're making trade-off decisions, right? Like, well, gee, this might not work. Should we spend extra money to, to uh, you know, put next to, to improve the system? Should we put another one on? Should we write it off and save the money now before we start building things? Um, we have a, a, a tight cost cap that we have to work toward and a tight schedule, even though it's seven years, there's still, we gotta, we gotta still make it. Um, and so those are the things that we're working toward uh, at the moment. Now, will it be manufactured by NASA but at one of their facilities? So uh, it is funded by NASA, but uh, we pr wrote the proposal through uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory of the Johns Hopkins University. And so they will be doing the manufacture of the, the vehicle itself, the octocopter itself. Um, uh, but we have a lot of different involvement uh, across the spectrum. Our cruise stage, the part, obviously you can't use your propellers to fly through space. The part that flies us through space is being built by Lockheed Martin. And the um, entry shell uh, that will protect us from uh, the fiery entry into Titan's atmosphere at seven kilometers per second is being built by NASA Langley and NASA Ames. Um, so we have actually a very wide uh, uh, spread of uh, where individual bits are being manufactured. NASA Goddard is building our mass spectrometer, for instance. Excellent, excellent. That's an amazing project. I know there are a lot of questions, so I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Sandy to get some of those fielded. I have a couple for you. Uh, how closely are you working are you working with NASA slash JPL on your Dragonfly program? Okay, well, those are two different things, right? NASA, we are, we're hand in glove with NASA. Uh, we, we wrote the proposal to NASA. It was actually a really weird experience uh, in that when we wrote the proposal to NASA, we'd ask them questions. They'd be like, hey, you know, we can't tell you what the answer is. We wrote the AO. It's your job to figure it out and you'll propose. And if we don't like what you want, what you say, we're not going to take you and you're done. Uh, and then once we got selected, it was like, completely coming full, full circle after that we were I was up at NASA headquarters um, after that and they said look your problems now are our problems so you'd let us know what resources you need and we'll give them to you so I really it's almost scary we have I feel like we have the full backing of the United States government um, behind us uh, giving us every chance to succeed and that feels amazing in some ways and it's also really scary because this better work <laughs> um, JPL is a partner of ours. We have some co-investigators at JPL and they're helping us do our navigation. But Na JPL had put in a competing proposal that was not selected. So we're working with them, but I wouldn't say that they're, you know, uh, one of the, the core critical partners. That kind of segues into the question that came after that. Did NASA tell you, tell your team what differentiated your proposal from the others that were declined? Yeah, um, it was really the science. We had better science, uh, more interesting science questions. Um, and we, it was really our capability to do more. And that's really unusual. Usually it's, oh, yours was the safe proposal. But in our case, uh, it was the actual um, the, the prospect uh, for discovery uh, and the prospect that we could do that with uh, reasonable risk posture uh, that won us over. Um, basically, you know, in, those, in that room where you get reviewed, there's people that are, um, you know, brought in for their expertise on other missions. So we were competing against a comet sample return mission and a, Mar a moon sample return mission uh, and a Saturn probe uh, that involved David Atkinson, actually, who's a, who's a, a former uh, professor here at University of, uh, of Idaho. And so there were Saturn probe people there, right? And so you, we had to make our case that, well, obviously the, Sat the people there to primarily evaluate the Saturn probe were going to like the Saturn probe. But really what differentiates one proposal from another is which one does everyone read and they're like, well, obviously I like the one that I was brought in to review, but you know, of the others, this is really the one that stands out. And we must have been, we must have been that mission, right? I don't know what happened in that room, but there's only one way that we could have come out of that process and that's it. Awesome. All right, uh, next question. Do you know what rocket will launch Dragonfly, possibly a SpaceX rocket? So we don't get to decide that. Um, actually, the, the rocket uh, is decided by NASA uh, Launch Services, uh, and they will put it up for bid because uh, it's a big government contract, and whoever wins the bid will be who launches us. Practically, there are really only a couple of options, and that's the Falcon Heavy or uh, an Atlas V-5-1. Um, those, are the, those are the most likely um, options. 
the Atlas um, is more expensive, but it's, they've done the paperwork already. Um, our power source is a nuclear battery, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator that will be built at Idaho National Lab um, down in the southeast part of the state here. Um, and the recent Mars rovers, including Perseverance, which just launched this summer, was launched on an Atlas um, 531, 551, because, for this very reason, um, because the paperwork had already been done. You do want to be kind of careful when you're launching nuclear material, and it takes um, a, a several tens of millions of dollars of paperwork to verify that you're safe and that you have uh, your, your rocket you're launching on is safe, and that paperwork has been done for the Atlas. Um, so that's uh, going to make it more cost competitive, maybe, uh, with the Falcon Heavy that's uh, ticket, you know, that's that's a sticker price is lower, but it might require more paperwork. So it's up to NASA. They'll be making that decision, uh, not us, though. Right. Right. Why did we create the wheel? If part of it's already done, you already have the paperwork, right? Um, the engineers want to do that because they want to minimize the paperwork. I kind of want to go to Falcon Heavy because we can we might be able to shave off a couple years from our eight and a half year cruise if we launched it on Falcon Heavy because it's got greater capability. Um, so it's you know I want to I want I want to get there sooner and the engineers want to do less you know do less work they want to just go back to what they know. So I think um, I think there are merits to both uh, ideas, but it's it's out of our hands in that case. Right. Um, another question: What instruments will be on board? So we've got, um, we've paired uh, down to four instruments. Uh, our Cadillac instrument, our most valuable instrument is a mass spectrometer. So this is like an electronic nose. Its job is to identify the surface composition of Titan, uh, which we don't know. Titan is mostly made of water ice, especially on its outer bit, but the methane in its atmosphere breaks into these complex hydrocarbons that we think coat the surface in some places and agglomerate into these sand dunes near the equator. Um, and so that's going to be our most important instrument. Where it's going to look for whether or not we see like amino acids, the building blocks of life um, there on Titan. Um, I think there. I think that the chemistry um, probably should have produced some, but we don't know. Uh, and that would be a really, uh, really fascinating and critical inst uh, measurement that um, will have have a bearing on how life forms. Right? We can't go back in time and look four and a half billion years ago to figure out how life formed on Earth. That uh, record has unfortunately been destroyed by geologic activity on this very active world. But Titan um, is sort of like uh, a frozen primitive Earth where we can go and see what those, uh, that, that abiotic chemistry looks like um, with these experiments that Titan's been doing for four billion years and we can just land and scoop up the results. Um, in order to get the material into that mass spectrometer, we have uh, a sampling system that uh, is actually the same sampling system you use to uh, sample organics from your carpet. Uh, it's a vacuum cleaner, basically. Um, and Titan is interesting because it's the only place you can sample like that other than Earth, okay? Mars' atmosphere is too thin. It just can't suck. Venus's atmosphere is thick enough, but Venus's atmosphere is 700 Kelvin. Uh, so if you suck that in, you'll just melt your, your internals. So Titan is really the only place where this works. Um, and so we'll be able to suck up those um, sand particles, uh, bring them through our system, and be able to introduce them to our mass spectrometer to determine what their composition is. Um, and that's really our most, um, that's really our flagship instrument. We also have a gamma ray neutron spectrometer that's looking at elemental composition. So the mass spectrometer is looking for the molecular composition. The gamma ray neutron spectrometer emits neutrons um, that knock electrons out uh, of orbitals that then will get them to release gamma rays that are characteristic of the elemental composition. So oxygen, sodium, chlorine, um, whereas uh, you know, the, the mass spectrometer will be measuring, do you have you know, a big CH3N or whatever, uh, you know, what the actual uh, buildup of, of, of atoms is into molecules. So those two measurements are quite complementary. Um, and then to complement that, we have uh, a geophysics and meteorology package that'll be measuring the weather conditions as they vary uh, temperature, pressure, humidity, uh, wind speed, wind direction, but also uh, has a seismometer uh, to listen for Titan quakes, which we're really excited to perhaps be able to discover because it might tell us something about the deep interior of Titan. I said the outside of Titan is made of water ice, but we think that 100 kilometers down, there's a liquid ocean layer underneath but we don't know how far down that is, uh, and a seismometer would be able to really allow us to nail down that 
um, distance. Now our last instrument is uh, cameras. We have eight different cameras, two that look forward, two that are on our um, radio dish that sends uh, data home that can build up uh, panoramas of the entire area. Then we have two that are looking downward at our landing skids um, that look at the sampling area and then two microscopic cameras that look exactly at the spot. We have a little drill um, so that it'll be able to zoom in on the drill spot uh, and the drill core and the exact material that we want to be able to sample. Um, so we should be able to get pictures from all eight of those cameras. Oh. All right. What is, there's a lot of questions. People are very curious. I'm, this is exciting. Uh, what is your energy output slash longevity for the onboard nuclear, nuclear fission reactor? Okay, so it's not a reactor. Um, it's actually a passive uh, radioisotope thermo, uh, thermoelectric generator is what we call it. Okay, so the way it works is, um, right, a reactor actually brings uh, uranium or plutonium to near criticality, where it generates a lot of uh, thermal energy that is used to boil water and drive a turbine. So what we have actually instead is just a passive uh, plutonium dioxide brick made of plutonium-238, which is not bomb grade material, has a half-life of about 94 years, but it gets hot. It gets these bricks up to about, you know, 550, Kel uh, 550 Celsius. So those um, bricks then um, uh, we put next to a, 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 a uh, an electronic device called a thermocouple. And this thermocouple um, is a really cool material. If you heat one side and cool the other side, it produces electricity. And in fact, the process works in reverse, so that if you put electricity through it, it creates a hot and a cold side. And in fact, I have this uh, thermoelectric cooler for my car. You plug into the 12 volt, okay? And you turn it on the hot side or the cold side, and it kind of works like a, a, a refrigerator. It does work like a refrigerator. I mean, it's not very good, but it works okay. Um, to be able to you know, keep things cold in your car for low power input. So similarly, we have a hot side and a cold side. We radiate to the cold Titan atmosphere. Uh, to be able to generate electricity using one of these thermocouples. So the advantage is there's no moving parts. And these things have been proven uh, for 50 years. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft, which were launched when I was born um, in the late 1970s, have been flying uh, across the solar system for almost 45 years now. And we still get signals from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 um, at the outer edge of the solar system. They're still, their nuclear batteries are still running uh, after 40 or 50 years. So that's the good part. The, lo the bad part is they're not very efficient. They're only about 7% efficient. Um, but that generates about 80 watts of power, um, which we use to trickle charge a battery. So that's our primary power source is actually kind of the battery. Well, not our primary, but our proximal power source. Um, Titan it has a very slow rotation. Like our moon, um, Titan only rotates once every 16 days. <clears throat> So for eight days of Titan night, we kind of don't have anything to do. So we just charge the battery, use that time to charge the battery, and then we run off the battery during the day effectively to do higher power activities that you know, require more than 80 watts, but we just store it in that battery to be able to use it when we need it. And then you kind of answered the next question, which what, what powers the quad? You kind of talked about that right there, right? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's okay. what's going on. It's the, it's the radioisotope thermoelectric generator and the battery working together. Okay. Next question. What's the sensor slash sample collection packages to be incorporated on the quadcopter? Um, so I did talk about that some. Here, let me show a picture of it. Um, can, you have, can you let me share my screen? I can show a... Uh, I don't know how to do that. Let's see. It says it's, the host has disabled it. Um, <laughs> of course. Probably smart in many cases, but you I want to make him a host. If you're the host, Sandy, you can make him a host, and then he'll be able to share it. I am a host. I apologize for I'm uh, more make a host. There we go. Do I want to change it? Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right. Okay. There you go. All right. So here is. Um, my student, uh, Shannon, who's now working there, um, uh, has been hired on as staff at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory next to a mock-up of the full vehicle. Isn't it huge? Okay, like, you'd, well, I work on these CAD drawings and I, I always tell you, the real thing is bigger than you think it's gonna be. So I knew that, so I had it bigger than I thought it was gonna be, and this is bigger than that. So it's big enough you could lay in here 
um, and go to Titan if you want. I don't recommend it because we don't have a lot of snacks on board, but um, in principle, um, you, could, you, could, you could fit on there. So the sampling system um, is we have two sampling systems, one on each skid. So this is the sampling system here. Uh, it consists of a drill um, that will allow us to take the solid ice that's there and to break it into little particles that we can suck up with our vacuum cleaner. And then uh, these are the vacuum blowers here. Uh, and then we have two redundant vacuum blowers. Of course, you're off a billion kilometers, a uh, billion miles away from the earth. Um, you gotta have backups in case things go bad. Um, so that's why we have two redundant systems here. We have two different drill systems, two different sampling systems, two different blowers. And then we have uh, two different sets of tubes that connect in little um, uh, central manifolds here that we can, we can direct the, 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 uh, the air in any direction we want. And that heads up to this uh, carousel here of the sampling system. So this carousel has a bunch of little um, beakers, little beakers in it, little sample containers. Uh, 42 different uh, sample, I think we have less, we might have downsized, um, uh, that are able to uh, then reach up and sample directly from the, uh, the stream of air that's coming in. And then the sample carousel there will be able to bring that around and put that sample into uh, the mass spectrometer. So this is a really um, relatively big, uh, heavy, expensive, and complicated system that we spend a lot of effort uh, designing. Um, previous planetary missions have run into issues when sampling. So for instance, the Mars Phoenix lander, which landed near Mars's North Pole, um, had a scoop. So it scooped up the dirt and then it tried to put it in the sample container, but it was stuck and they couldn't get it out. Turns out it was more cohesive than they thought. There's one third gravity there on Mars and they couldn't get the dirt out of the scoop. Um, so we want to definitely think ahead for how we're going to solve those problems and this sort of um, uh, system is, is what we've shaken, what has shaken out. We tried a little, a lot of different things. We've done physical experiments actually um, on drills. Um, these are rotary percussive drills, like a hammerhead drill you use to drill through uh, concrete. Um, and we've tested those on low temperature water, uh, ice, and uh, organics um, and verified that they work under Titan conditions. So the sampling system is really, I think, sophisticated um, and one of our real strengths. Uh, one another question. What wind speeds will the copter encounter? We are landing um, uh, near the in the equatorial deserts um, in the calm part of the year. Um, not we do tend to get some storms along the deserts there in the spring and the fall near equinox, but we're landing uh, near uh, southern uh, summer, so we shouldn't uh, be too close to that. It takes. Uh, Titan, of course, which orbiting Saturn, takes Saturn 28 years to go around the sun. So each season is seven Earth years. So we got some time. Um, we think that the very uh, largest uh, wind speeds we might encounter might be 1.2, maybe as an absolute maximum in a dust devil, maybe up to three meters per second. So that's like six, eight miles an hour. Not very, not very high. Okay. And the reason for that is, the, sorry, uh, the atmosphere is real thick and the, the sunlight's only 1% is effective. So there's just not a lot of energy to drive very strong convection there. Uh, just a comment here, go Falcon Heavy. <laughs> so, um, the next one, the surfaces on Titan vary. Will the Dragonfly copter land on liquid or ground surfaces? And how will the MMRTG operate? Charge batteries and or capacitors or drive all loads direct? Right, so I talked about that, um, right. where we're using the RTG to, uh, to trickle charge the battery, but we're really running off the battery. All right, the RTG provides about 80 watts of power. To fly takes us kilowatts, many kilowatts. Um, so uh, we, we definitely can't fly on the, on the RTG alone, but if given enough time, we're able, we're able to use it. Um, we're landing uh, in the equatorial region. Uh, like I said, in the desert, it's actually quite far from the lakes, so we don't expect to counter any, encounter any you know, large liquid pools, but we might get um, uh, local puddles uh, in, in, in some huddle, uh, huddled locations. But we don't really expect to see that. Um, but we are landing in the sand dunes, which is a huge feature, okay? Um, turns out, and I've, I've come from a physics background and not a geology background, so I didn't appreciate this till I went to visit some sand dunes. Um, here we go. Here's that picture I took from um, the sand dunes in the Southwest African country of Namibia that are a dead ringer for the ones on Titan. 
Titan has a low temperature. They're made of different things, totally different atmospheric, you know, conditions and composition and gravity. But it also has about 100 meter high sand dunes separated by three or four kilometers from the next one. And in between them are these areas called interdunes that have no sand. And I hiked down to this area, it's gravel. It's gravel, there's no sand on it. So there's this giant mountain of, of sand here. There's another one three kilometers away and in between, gravel. So it's just an amazing thing that the universe does. You put a bunch of sand on a surface and it doesn't just stay there, it clumps up into dunes and leaves the areas in between with no dunes. That's so crazy. But what it allows us to do is to be able to sample both the composition of the organic sand and of the water ice bedrock underneath it just by going a couple kilometers away from one another. Um, so that's going to be our proximal goal once we land is to be able to get between the dunes and the inner dunes to sample both. And ultimately we're going to fly to an 80 kilometer wide uh, impact crater where an asteroid, about an eight kilometer wide asteroid slammed into Titan in its past. And the reason we want to do that is that the surface is made of water ice, but it's hella cold. It's 90 Kelvin. Okay, there's no life in that today. But if you slam an asteroid into it, you melt that surface ice into a melt pool that can be hundreds of meters thick and that can survive for 10,000 years as a liquid. So that's what we want to be able to get to sample, that liquid that's interacted with the surface organics for 10,000 years to figure out what happens when you mix water and organics and leave them to go. Um, we think this is part of the process that must have uh, formed life uh, on early Earth. But this allows us to actually experimentally measure that process, uh, at least part of it. Um, that leads us into this question. You kind of talked about it. These two next questions are a little related. Is the copter operating autonomously or will you direct it from Earth? Then can you talk about how you navigate it? Um, is the atmosphere clear or opaque? IFR versus V, now you're talking Greek. IFR versus VFR and no I have DPF. a pilot's license, I don't know what those mean. Okay. So, <laughs> you do, um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so, um, the answer is a mix of both uh, in terms of whether we control it or whether it controls itself. It's a hundred, uh, it's about a hundred light minutes away. So it takes a hundred minutes for our radio waves, hour and a half, to travel up there and back. So the, we can't have a graduate student with the joystick flying around, okay? So it has to do its own flights. Each flight's only gonna last half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, but after it lands, um, it's gonna uplink all the information from its last flight, information about where it flew over to investigate its future landing site. And we will use that information to decide where it's gonna go next and how far to fly, uh, and it will be flying on its own. So how does it navigate? Yes, there's no GPS. Um, so we're largely inertially navigating, meaning we have an accelerometer on board and we figure, well, if we're going that way at 10 meters per second for 100 seconds, we must have gone a kilometer. Uh, so there's some dead reckoning there, but we also have a rather relatively sophisticated optical navigation system where we look down and we match up the features we see on the ground with ones we've seen before. Uh, sort of like a trail of optical breadcrumbs to be able to allow us to get back to uh, places we've taken images from uh, from the air to be able to make sure we land at the right site. Okay. Uh, the atmosphere itself is, uh, sorry, if you look at it, you know, in the optical, you can't see the surface because uh, Titan's atmosphere is full of haze. Uh, it's very much like those of you that are experiencing a smoky day today, um, except that Titan's atmosphere, you're not looking through only 100 kilometers of it. I mean, Earth's atmosphere maybe goes up 10 kilometers, the, the, the troposphere. Titan's atmosphere is much thicker, and so it's, it, you can't see down through it. However, if you're down near the surface, um, you still can see the optical depths aren't too bad. Uh, in terms of, um, if you're a pilot, uh, if you were to report the visibility, the visibility would still be, uh, you know, probably near 10 miles uh, visibility. Uh, it, it definitely gets hazy in the distance, um, but if you're within a kilometer or two, you shouldn't see very much uh, uh, opacity at all. You'll be able to see through it not, without too much of a problem. Okay. Um, will there be any gravity assist flybys to gain delta V en route to Saturn? If so, which bodies will be utilized? Venus, Earth, Jupiter? Special yeah, Earth? those are the ones. Uh, do I have that in here? I might have cut that from my uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, 
Oh, here it is. Okay. All right. So here's the plan. Uh, we were actually originally planning to launch in 2025, but uh, NASA assigned us our backup launch where we were supposed to get an Earth gravity assist. It's fine for us, actually. They arrive at the same time. So uh, we have one gravity assist uh, around Venus uh, is the first gravity assist. Then we have an, two Earth gravity assists um, separated by uh, three years or so. And we have to be careful uh, that we don't accidentally crash into Earth with our nuclear battery. Um, uh, so we have a lot of thinking that's gone into that. So that's part of why it takes so long. If you were to just go straight out from Earth to, to, to Saturn, you could get there in uh, three or four years, no problem. Uh, but we have, we're taking the long route to save money. Uh, we can launch on a smaller, cheaper rocket that way. Okay. Um, and what rechargeable battery technology will be used? So we've got a lithium ion uh, space rated battery. Uh, so it's light, it's kind of the stuff that you, uh, very similar to what you'd have in a Tesla. Uh, we have a, although the, the battery is much smaller. Uh, it's about eight kilowatt hours. It's about one tenth as big as the battery in my Model 3. Um, because we got to fly it out to Saturn and it's got to be able to get there. But that's still enough for us to fly over 10 kilometers of range um, in a single hop, which is pretty good. Perfect. Oh, I have one more and then we'll probably wrap it up. We want to be... I'm happy, I'm happy to keep going. So how are we okay. going to do it? Um, what is your dreams, your dream scientific finding? Well, um, we have five science goals and goal five was one that I, uh, advocated for that we ended up putting on there that almost got us in trouble. So the goal five is to uh, execute an active search for chemical biosignatures in Titan. So we are looking for signs of life. We're not, we don't have a, a microscope. We're not looking for bugs. Um, it's like, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for the chemical um, products that life might've produced. Turns out, there are hundreds or thousands of different types of amino acids that you can create in chemistry, if you can create in a lab. Algae only uses 22 of them. So we're looking for similar selection effects on Titan. We might not know how life is gonna work there, but presumably it will select for individual molecules that it finds most useful, like life has done here. And therefore, when we look at the distribution of molecules will be some particular molecules that are really useful that would be overproduced relative to what they would normally get if they were no, if you were just produced by an abiotic process. Uh, we're also looking for handedness. Uh, any amino acid, um, like any Rubik's cube configuration, um, can come into both a right or a left-handed version. And life on Earth uses all of one version for amino acids and none of the other. It's a really wide bias. Uh, and so we also have a mechanism to be able to measure the handedness or the chirality of the molecules that we discover, um, thinking that these, if we see something here, we might, uh, they might be a, a signature that there could be, or there may have been in the past, um, some primitive form of single cell life on Titan. That would be, I think, the very most exciting uh, discovery we could possibly make. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's what I expect, but we're capable of making that discovery um, should the conditions there um, be favorable. Okay. Oh, I got another one. <laughs> How long will the copter have to charge for each flight? Um, so uh, typically we want to um, run the battery down as much as we can during the day. Um, what really limits our ability to do science is how much data we can beam home. Um, so we have this uh, dish on the back. Here we go. It's a, a phased array, a flat phased uh, um, radio dish. Uh, TV antenna that will be beaming the data home. And we want to use all the energy we have, all the, all the um, battery we possibly can during the day, uplinking data home. The data don't come home very fast. They're coming at about 2,000 bits per second, which for those of you that were using modems in 1983, you're very familiar with this speed. Those of you that are more modern, this would seem like some cruel form of torture. But um, this is the best we can do from, you know, 10... Uh, times the distance from Earth, you know, uh, or the, the distance from Earth to the sun out to out there uh, and without an orbital relay uh, spacecraft. Um, and so we really want to run the, the battery down as much as we can, but then we charge it overnight. So we can always charge from zero to 100% um, oh. over the eight days, eight Earth days of Titan night, and we'll wake up with a full battery in the morning ready, ready to do science. Oh. That's impressive. 
Um, that is all the that questions that I have. Oh, what? oh, I just got another one. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite science fiction novel? Totally off the subject. <laughs> my very favorite. Well, you know, I've been reading with my kids again, um, uh, David Brin's Uplift trilogy, which is, the kids like it because they have talking dolphins in it. I like it because the planets he invents in those ser in that series are just really well thought out. They're really detailed and they're really uh, sort of interesting for me, to me from a planet uh, perspective of how, how else you could make maybe a habitable planet and how it might be different and how it might be similar to Earth and how, what the consequences of that might be. So uh, the first good novel in that series is called Star Tide Rising. And it is about dolphins, talking dolphins, flying spaceships, but it's really good. It's really good. <laughs> Are we, is uh, that it? No, I just got one more, and then we're, I'm going to cut it off at that point. Um, okay. what, will the second Earth gravity assist flyby be similar to the similar to that for the Cassini mission, or will it be closer or further from the Earth? Do you know the Earth flyby altitude and velocity? Oh, I don't know if I know those off the top of my head. Um, there are definitely restrictions as to how close we can get. Uh, and those are based on we need to have a less than one one in a million probability of impact, even if like uh, the computer goes haywire and the rocket engine starts firing randomly or something. Right. Uh, and so for that reason, we always bias our uh, flyby altitudes away. I think we're at a thousand kilometers altitude, and we're flying by must be at oh I don't I don't know the flyby velocity, so I'm not going to I'm not going to make up a number. Um, uh, but it's, okay, I'll make up a number. It's probably about 15 kilometers per second um, uh, at its closest approach. But I think we're at 1,000 kilometers altitude, which is below, um, like, uh, geostationary uh, altitude where all the um, uh, communication satellites are at, but well above the International Space Station, for instance, which is at 400 kilometers. None of us will hold you to those numbers, so. Okay, I appreciate that. We're gonna believe, we're gonna believe you, because you are- both correct within a factor of two, which is- <laughs> We believe uh, anything you say. <laughs> so with that, um, I just want to say, wow, and thank you so, so much, Dr. Burns. I am so proud that you're at the University of Idaho, one, and I'm so um, excited that students today get to work with someone like you. So thank you for your time. Um, maybe in 2025, when was it going to be? <laughs> we'll gather up, yeah, we'll gather up again and we'll talk about about some of the results that you're getting. Until then, thank you everyone for uh, participating, for the great questions. Um, have a great rest of your evening. And um, as always, go Vandals. <laughs>